Welcome to the Trisco Podcast. We are three druids gathered in a virtual grove to share our thoughts and our path with you. Hi, welcome to the Trisco Podcast. This is episode number 23, and today we're going to be talking about offerings. But before we get started, let's first do introductions. I'm Victoria. My pronouns are she and her. I'm Drum, and my pronouns are he and him. And I'm Amber, and my pronouns are she and her. And as I mentioned today, we're going to be talking about offerings. So if you are just finding us and listening to us for the first time or watching us for the first time, welcome to the podcast. And if you are a returning listener or viewer, welcome back. There is, certainly in our traditions, there is a lot of conversation about offerings and what are they and what are they for and what do I give and how much do I give and how much does it have to hurt that we thought it was worthwhile actually having a conversation about that today. So let's start out with what is an offering? I mean, an offering is a gift. It is something that we're giving to someone else, some other being. Um, I think that's, for me, that's the easiest definition. I like that definition too. I think it's, you know, a gift that we give um, to, a, as Amber said, to a being, an entity, someone that we're trying to establish a relationship with or that we already have a relationship with. I think I, I agree. We all agree on a definition. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's kind of cool. Um, so, Drum, you mentioned that you would, would offer, uh, make an offering to a being who you wanted to form a relationship with, or maybe yes. you have a relationship with. Um, is there any difference between those perspectives? I think so. I think that um, it's, uh, if I can use the analogy of having guests come over to the house, um, if you're, if someone's coming over to the house that's never been there before, you really don't know what to offer. So you try to offer something that's, that's respectful and neutral. Um, so you may offer them a glass of wine, let's say. Uh, whereas if, you know, if there's a particular deity that likes hard liquor, you know, or whiskey, then you're going to know immediately to offer them whiskey or a bar of chocolate or whatever. So I think as you're getting to know someone, uh, start with a more neutral offering and then, um, you know, work your way up. I mean, the most neutral offering I think would be like water, but I think if you're trying to welcome somebody, um, I, I, that might be a little too neutral. I don't know if you're in Arizona this week, water might be Water would be good, yes. <laughs> for me, it's, uh, it is the same thing for me. It's like if I'm welcoming somebody into my home, if they're a friend, I'll know what they like and I'll offer them what they like. If they're somebody who's new to the house, I will usually ask. Um, and then I think in the case of spirits that asking can come in a number of different forms, right? It could be divination, it could be researching the lore, it could be actually asking other people who have uh, worked with that being before what they, what they have offered to see if something makes sense. It's also that sort of intuition we talked about a bit last week of, I don't know, what do you think, right? Like walk around the kitchen and go, does this, does this seem like it might work? Uh, and see what you come up with. And I think that's part of that, the difference between that relationship that's already established and, and a relationship that's new is you may have built some sort of um, UPG, your own knowledge that works well for you that isn't in the lore or isn't, you know, other people haven't experienced or whatever. You don't have any of that to go from if it's a new being that you're trying to work with. It was a poorly timed set. So, so how would you figure out if you had a brand new new being you were trying to connect with? And I've mentioned a couple of different ways um, before, but how would you connect? How would you figure out what to actually offer? I usually do start with the lore. I, you know, I look at the mythology that's tied to those beings and, and the stories that we do know and see if there's an item 
in that mythology that ties in in a way that I think would work as a an offering, you know, something that they they are known through mythology to already enjoy. I think that's really reasonable, especially you know, in certain um, hearth cultures, some products or some things are going to be more readily available if you're in a Mediterranean uh, climate than olive olive oil, for example. Uh, just thinking about one of the offerings I use in some rites is readily available, whereas in northern climates, it's more, you know most likely going to be something different. So, but I do. I mean, I, the lore is a great place to start. Uh, but I think if I'm, uh, if I don't find something there in the lore, I think I do the walk around the kitchen thing. It's really, um, as opposed to doing a divination and saying, well, is it this, is it that, is it the other thing? Um, I tend to look around and see what I have and see if, you know, my intuition says maybe that'll resonate. The other place that, you know, I do tend to look is if you could find rituals to that being elsewhere. So, you know, ADF has a lot of uh, rituals on our website so I'll go look through those rituals and see what offerings that they were using or if there's nothing on our website go to look at you know other organization web, uh, websites for rituals and you know look at look at other people who have done that work and try to find what did they use what worked for them right it's worth trying so then the question is how much do you offer like what, what is considered a good offering versus a chintzy offering or a, 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 an offering that is not, not enough? I think for myself, I, you know, the, the glass of wine thing is uh, a good place to start. And I would, you know, just, if I had a guest coming over, I probably wouldn't fill the glass all the way up to the top. I'd fill it you know, a half to two thirds full uh, and, and start with that kind of offering. I mean, I think offering a tankard, uh, you know, to someone who's walking in the door may be a, a little bit too much and offering them a shot glass may not be, uh, you know, quite enough as well. So I think something, um, you know, in the middle, like the old golden rule stuff. Um, I think a lot of that really depends kind of on your situation. You know, if, if one bottle of wine is all you can afford for a year, and so all you can offer is a shot of it. That's cool. You know, I think that, or if you live in a tiny apartment and you don't have a way to dispose of massive amounts of offering. And so you're using, you know, a small pinch of incense for your offering or, you know, something along those lines. I think that that's acceptable. You know, I, I think that your, your, it has to work for your circumstance. Um, you know, more is, everybody loves presents. More presents is always nice to receive. But, you know, if you go to somebody's house, and they don't have a lot and they don't have a massive roast to serve you. That's okay. I know for myself living in a tiny apartment in that uh, when it comes to things like incense and oils, I use small pinches of incense because that's a lot of smoke and it'll set off a smoke alarm and that's not a good thing. Yeah. And with if I'm giving oils, it's usually just a few drops because I tend to put them in in my candle. So I'll wait for the candle to actually melt a little bit of wax and then add the oil to that. And you don't want to put too much oil in it or you'll mess up your candle and bad things will happen. Well, not bad things, but not fun things. And so there's those layers of how much do you offer? I um I have a small space on the top of a bookshelf that is my altar. So there's not a lot of space to put stuff. And it's, you'll get pinches of herbs and you'll get drops of, drops of oil. And I have little shot glasses where I'll give uh, liquor or water or wine. Um, I know for me, if I do something big like for me, a big offering, I really, really want this offering is a glass of wine because generally I offer smaller amounts. And so I think there's also something relative there about like how, where you're working, how much you're working. 
and what your current situation is. You may not be able to afford any alcohol. Right. And you know, and you don't have a lot of space. So a shot glass of water on your altar or on your shrine is what makes sense for you. And that's really cool because that's you have intentionally given something to these beings and just that act of intentional giving is worth a lot. Well, and I think that the, the regularity of those offerings is part of that as well. You know, if this is a being that you only work with once a year, you only ever, you know, make one offering to them in that time frame. you know, maybe that should be a little bit bigger offering than someone that you're making offerings to every single day. You know, if you came to visit my house every day, I'm not going to meet you at the door with a big old glass of wine and be like, drink up, you know, <laughs> but you know, I may offer you a glass of water or, yeah. you know, something and then offer you wine on Friday. You know, it's, it, it, I think it varies based on what you're doing, what your living situation is, where, you know, where you live, what's available. I don't think that there's a right way to give offerings. I think that intent plays a huge part in that. I know that when I, my daily workings that I do with my household spirits, which is something I do every day, and I, it's a, a, an important part of my practice, I have a little espresso cup with water in it, and I dip my fingers in that cup three times. And so the amount of water I get on my fingers onto a stone, uh, that's the amount of offering that they get. So it's, um, I don't think it's, as, as has been said here, I don't think it's the amount, it's the, uh, it's the right amount. Uh, and I think that those three, you know, those three dips are just right for what, what has to be done. And I know that like I, I have uh, worked with Freya for a very, very large working, which was very personal. And that offering was an entire handmade blanket, handmade by me. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of time and effort that went into making that particular offering, but it felt appropriate for the working that I had requested or for the help that I had requested. Um, and so I think also it matters with what you're, what you're giving the offering for. So like daily offerings, you can be smaller, right? It's more regular. It's that like, I, I go over to Amber's house and she's like, hey, welcome back. You were here yesterday. You want some water? Versus, you know, I show up at Amber's house for the first time in five years and, and maybe we have a joint meal together. I mean, it's a very different kind of offer, different kind of relationship depending on frequency. Um, it also, I think, depends on the relationship that you have, right? We mentioned a little bit earlier that there's a difference between beings you know and beings you don't know. And there's a level of, if I'm working with Carithwin, there are certain offerings that are cool that if I was working with a being that I didn't know, that I hadn't worked with before, might not be quite appropriate. And, and you know, I might wanna like ramp up either the frequency or the type of offering um, or the volume of offering, all different ways you can, you can do more for offering. Um, and again, water, perfectly acceptable offering. That's what you got. Uh, there are actually some traditions that say that for certain classes of spirits, you should only offer water. So uh, water is a very, very acceptable offering, I think, for anything. I do too. It's also an offering that evaporates, or yeah. uh, should I say, is consumed. So that's the nice thing about that is that it will be consumed by the spirits of, uh, of the place, the spirits in question. Well, if you think about it, of how many of many of the ancients, and I believe that the Greeks were among this, who who believed that the burning of offerings, the smoke carried the offerings to to the gods. Evaporation really kind of is the same thing. You just can't see it. Right. Well, and the other thing that the Greeks did that I, I absolutely to me, I think it's why I have the opinion I do on offerings that volume doesn't matter, is that they offered the scraps, the fat they couldn't cook with, the bones, the skin, you know, the parts of animals that they couldn't consume. That's what was offered. They weren't offering the best cuts of meat and, you know, the things that were useful for humans. 
it was the stuff that was left over anyway. And so it was a very conservative way to not give up things that they needed for themselves, but still acknowledge those beings. So once you've given offerings, I know none of us have a, I don't think Amber has, a permanent outdoor shrine where we give daily offerings, but we all give regular offerings. How do you dispose of those offerings once they have been consumed? Liquids who evaporate are easy. The glass is now empty. Take the glass, wash the glass. Oils that burn in a candle, well, they're gone. So that's easy. But offerings of grain or food or physical goods that don't evaporate or are, are currently burned, how do you get rid of those? What do you do with them when they're done? And when is done? There are, um, there's a rite that I do on a monthly basis that uses barley uh, or some kind of grains. And so what I do is I collect the, the barley or the grain that I use in that rite. And then when I'm done with the rite, I, I bring that, that offering outside. It's not cooked barley, it's dried barley. And so I leave it as an offering in my garden. Uh, it's, and um, so I feel, I, you know, it's gone. It's gone pretty quickly. So I think that there are some creatures out there, whether they're mice or whatever, that eat those, eat those things and consume them. So I feel that's a proper place for waters that I, that I collect. Um, you know, those go into plants or also into my garden. Uh, so it's an, it's kind of a, a repurposed offering. I'm not trying to, you know, say, oh, hey, I brought you something brand new, but it's, it's a way of taking an offering that I use in a ritual and, and, and making it an offering to something that's, that's living. I have done those same things where you use something like bird seed or, you know, things that can be consumed safely by animals is your offerings and rituals. And then you leave them in nature so that they can be consumed by animals. Um, but I've also done like bonfires in my yard intentionally to burn offerings that are not necessarily that way. Um, we did a ritual a few years ago that was an ancestor ritual and each person made an offering to their ancestors, but it was like a handwritten letter to their loved ones. I can't just leave that in my yard, you know? So I, we built a bonfire and we burned all of those papers and, you know, sent that message to the universe wherever it wanted to be as, as a form of offering. Um, so I've done that as well. Um, I actually have a jar that like a good size jar of like jewelry and stones and stuff that I've offered that just sits on a shelf um because it doesn't those are items that don't have a home and i don't feel comfortable just leaving outside you know so i have a, a place that they go when whenever they're done uh as the apartment dweller among us uh i i don't have a backyard i live on the 10th floor <laughs> i can't chuck stuff off my balcony it'll hit somebody in the head it's a very busy street down there <laughs> So, uh, so I have to get a little bit more creative with my offerings. Um, I have burned stuff in my, on my patio. Um, I don't hear in this apartment, but in previous apartments, I had a barbecue. And so I would get a cast iron, like a wide, shallow cast iron bowl or a terracotta bowl and sort of make a little fire in that, in the barbecue. Uh, and using the barbecue basically to contain the flame. But I don't have that here. And so most of my offerings go in the trash. So they sit on my altar for at least 24 hours. And after that, I consider them to be gone. I consider the essence of the offering to be gone after about a day. And so I take them, put them in the trash with a little prayer um, you know, offerings given, offerings received, and now I dispose of what remains. And that sort of makes it, I'm not just chucking it in the trash, I'm respectfully putting it in the trash, but I don't have anywhere else for it to go. It's a beautiful prayer. Thank you. Uh, so that actually is inspired by the hearth keeper's way. I, I shortened the prayer that was in there because Excellent. I like really short prayers. <laughs> 
And I think honestly, that's one of the questions that we, that I see most frequently about offerings is I live in a place where I can't, I don't have a yard. What do I do with this stuff? You know? And so I, I think that it's important to have those ideas, you know, I mean, and maybe the answer truly is you offer a small amount of water, you let it evaporate. Like that is a very, very easy answer to how do I handle offerings in an apartment? And that's why a lot of my offerings are things like drops of oil or uh, beverages. And when I do do physical offerings, they're small amounts because I don't have an easy way of getting rid of them. Right. And it, I mean, it also doesn't feel right to like offer a whole loaf of bread and then take that whole loaf of bread and put it directly into the trash can. Yeah. There's no other way for you to, to use that, you know. Uh, I will, I have, um, I have a small altar in the living room to our, I live in Irish territory. So the good neighbors are here. I have a small altar to them. Um, and they get the first full slice of bread for every time, every time I bake fresh bread, which tends to be about once a week. And, uh, so that gets, that gets placed on the altar and it sits there for about a week. And it's a very dry climate here. So I'm not worried about molding or anything. And then when I replace it, the old bread goes in the trash. Because by then it's crusty and nobody wants to eat it. Oh, it's a neat offering. And with that, I think we have come to the end of this episode. But before we go, it's time for a divination. And this is my turn this week. I am using the Lightseer's Tarot, uh, which I really, really enjoy. I love the imagery on these decks. Um, I, I have discovered there are many new decks that I absolutely love and y'all will see them as the Kickstarters get delivered. <laughs> Kickstarter is a dangerous place. Uh, yeah, so three decks in the last three months, pretty deadly. Wow. Yeah, they're Sorry. all funded, which means I'm getting a lot of decks. Um, you know, I know nothing about that. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I have one deck because you kickstarted something, Amber, and then told Oops. me about it. <laughs> but there's so much fun. Oh, I love that deck. I do love that deck. All right, so I'm going to draw three cards today, and the way that I tend to read three card readings is I look at the story. Well, this is a good start. So the Ten of Cups is the first card. <laughs> Sorry, love the imagery on these decks, Knight of Wands. And the Three of Cups. And if you can't see, she's, she's got a Trisco on the tattooed on her back, which I love. This is, I, I kind of want to squee a bit when I look at this particular reading. It's really a lot of fun with this reading. It's, it's about finding that home and that family and those friends and finding, finding your power and your strength and that, that potential in the drum that could just become this amazing thing. And working together with your friends, your family, finding your potential, finding that creative spark within you to really just embrace life. So I would say that this reading is telling us to look for that creative spark. Find that within us. Find what your drum is to beat and beat it. Find your friends who also beat that similar drum or who appreciate the drum you beat and work together to fulfillment and happiness in a community, in a chosen family, that supports you. I kind of like that reading. Very nice. And so with that, find the spark that beats your drum. And we will see you in a few weeks. 
Bye now. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for today's video. If you like this episode, be sure to like and subscribe. You can also find more episodes on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and all of your favorite podcast providers. You can find us on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, or for more information, visit our website, triscolpodcast.weebly.com.